Thank you very much. Uh, it's always nice to talk to your friends, and I, I, I feel lucky I, I know most of you. I, I think many of you have met just briefly one of them. Matt Eckerman. Um, and uh, as by way of introduction, uh, I thought I'd extend that little bit and just tell you a little bit more about where I'm coming from here and why I end up working on policy-related issues at all. So I come from an environmental and chemical engineering uh, training and background, although my college was a uh, liberal arts degree. Um, and some of my first work coming out of college and university was with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, Executive Office, what was then called the Executive Office oh, of Environmental Affairs. Affairs. Yeah. Um, so I worked there for a while with some consulting firms, nonprofit engineering. I have never worked in a large engineering firm, right? so I'm not a typical you know, civil engineer um, that you would see uh, mostly in the department. Um, my work with professional societies is with some of the standard engineering societies that you would think of, AICHE or AICE, but I'm also heavily involved in more kind of systemic systems modeling societies. Uh, one of the ones that I list here is the International Society for Industrial Ecology. And what do they do? They're concerned with really large scale flows of energy and materials and emissions. A lot of engineers work on single projects, this road or this motor, right? and we're worried about what's going on in the whole country technology deployment on a really large scale. Um, so I'm not, a, I would say, a typical uh, chemical or environmental um, engineer from that point of view. So in terms of these large scale um, questions, I wanted to give you a flavor of the types of policy analyses or policy relevant analyses that I do. Um, and I just wanted to start out with a couple really simple examples. Um, so here's, here's an easy example. You're looking at the largest train station in Asia. Um, this is the uh, train station connected to the Hongshou uh, Shanghai uh, train station next to the airport there. And it, it's a little hard to see, but on top of this train station is the largest building integrated photovoltaic array in the world, at least at that time, until China built an even bigger one. <laughs> More photovoltaic now. Okay, so it's capable of producing about six and a half million kilowatt hours of electricity per year. And this is you know, energy that's converted from sunlight, so seems like a great thing. We should put solar panels on all of our buildings and we'd be able to solve our uh, electricity uh, issues. If you extend this kind of uh, thinking, though, uh, and worry about where those panels are coming from, a little bit down the road from this train station is one of the major factories where uh, these panels are produced. And if you look at the energy it takes to make solar panels, especially the energy it takes to refine silicon, uh, it's about 415 kilowatt hours per panel. And there are 20,000 panels on the roof. So it's about 8.5 million kilowatt hours to make the panels. Uh, so for the first basically year and a half, all that's happening is that the panels are working off the energy debt it took to manufacture. Right? They're, they're negative energy territory until they get to about a year and a half. And these are with modern panels. Right? And if you look 20 years ago, there would be no payback in energy terms on these panels. They just didn't last long enough, and the conversion rate was low enough that they never worked off the energy debt of manufacturing. So we, in this industrial ecology mindset, try to enlarge the problem, look at the whole system, and get a sense of uh, energy flows on the large scale. So here's another uh, example, really simple one now. Uh, looking at the emissions side, this is uh, a guy from Ford. Is this the laser here? No. Well, Should be the, uh, in the middle. Okay. Oh, here we go. Well, you can't quite see it. <laughs> yeah. But this, this is a prototype. So the cord comes out of the front door uh, driver's side window. Uh, anyhow, he's holding a power cord, and Ford released this uh, advertisement that said, this uh, electric car had zero CO2 emissions and was really fun to drive. Right? Uh, and of course, this is a fallacy because the electricity that powers this vehicle is produced from, in this particular area, in our area, uh, a mix of electricity producers, including the Bridgeport Coal Fired Power Station. Right? And depending on where you are in the country or where you are in this particular uh, region, 
um, you'll have a different mix of these upstream emissions associated uh, with your vehicle. Not just that, but it takes energy and therefore releases emissions from <coughs> the manufacturing of the car, the batteries, the nickel, the cadmium, lithium ion in, in the modern uh, example um, to make this. So again, we're trying to enlarge the problem, right, look at emissions on a, on a large scale. This is what industrial ecology folks do. We don't just look at the car, we look at the whole mobility system, which is connected to the energy system, to try to get a sense of what uh, policy is going to uh, do in terms of overall emissions. Did they also even broaden it to like, what are the alternatives to driving at all? Mm -hmm. Like to putting in public transit? And sure, like that? yeah, you can do that too, um, in a comparative analysis. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, <clears throat> from my point of view, uh, I, I wanted to pose some policy questions uh, here uh, at the policy school, and this is from my kind of systems engineering perspective. These are the kinds of questions I uh, think about. One is that if I have an environmental policy, does it actually achieve its stated goals from an energy or environmental point of view? When I consider this kind of whole system, when I consider the life cycle perspective of these questions. So that's one kind of uh, interesting question I like to think about. Another is, Maybe I achieve my goals, but there's a cost that's kind of orthogonal. It's a cost in some other realm of energy and emissions or costs in economic terms. Um, or maybe they have benefits that are co-benefits um, that are happening. And I want to quantify those because as an engineer, I want numbers. I want to be able to compare uh, quantitative uh, measures. Or maybe I can make changes to technology or improvements in my engineering system that I can quantify and use to justify new policy. I can say, you're going to save $20 billion if you make this change in the energy system over the next 50 years in net present value terms. And you know, I can use that to say, well, this policy would be good for society. Um, so in, in general terms, um, this uh, is the, essentially the basis for the engineering systems work I do. And I'm going to give an example of each of these, just to give you, again, kind of flavor for what I'm up to. Um, so the, the kinds of tools I use to work on these, and it's a little bit cut off, but GIS, Material Flow Analysis, MFA, Life Cycle Assessment, LCA, Life Cycle Costing, LCC, Stats, or Risk Assessment. So there's a bunch of different types of tools we use, and, and uh, depending on the problem, we'll bring in other collaborators at, at, and uh, other realms of expertise. Um, so again, I, I wasn't sure exactly who would be here, but I wanted to just give a brief background into MFA and LCA. These are really the fundamental tools of industrial ecology, and I, for those of you who haven't seen it before, I thought it might be interesting to just go through an example. Uh, so here's material flow analysis in brief, MFA. In general, you take the principles of mass and energy balance, and you apply them to the entire economy. Right, or you know, a whole state or an entire uh, facility or company. Right? So we're not just looking in engineering terms at a single process anymore. We're looking, in this case, at steel flows through the United States economy. So steel gets mined, steel comes in from imports, right? it goes through blast furnace, steel mills, foundries, rolling, some of it gets lost. And I can put numbers if I follow where this steel is going. And because it's an element, luckily it doesn't disappear, uh, so it's easier to follow. Uh, and then I can see, well, what gets exported, right? what gets used here in the United States. And I can implement this type of diagram in dynamic terms to look at uh, stocks of steel and flows of steel over international boundaries over time. So on the right-hand side, this is some work from Daniel Mueller. And he looked all the way back at 1800. So you know, we were a much uh, less industrialized and less populous country back then. And what you're seeing here, this orange bit, is all the like, basically iron that was available in the ground in the United States. And any iron that could be mined. Okay? And over time, we mined it. We depleted it. This green is products in use. So we mined the iron. We made it into washing machines. And now those machines are in our houses. Some of that uh, iron um, came from other countries. Right? And you can see that little wedge there. And some of the iron got lost to landfills, or it got corroded into rust and washed out into the ocean. 
And so it's a way of looking at the whole economy, but in material terms or in energy terms. There's a lot of tools developed to do this in economic terms, right? And this is the basis of economics. We're using engineering principles, mass and energy balance, to do the same kind of analyses you do in economics, but in physical terms. So that's material flow analysis. Life cycle assessment is uh, related, um, but looks at emissions. Uh, so it's not just following material around, it's looking at the impacts of how that material is used. So it's also a systems modeling tool. Um, and just like we looked at in the examples, uh, a lot of us as consumers, we only see the newspaper that we're reading, the coffee that we're drinking, the computer that we're using, right? and we don't have a sense really of where it comes from, where it's manufactured, or where the raw materials come from that go into manufacturing, or where it goes when we throw it away, wherever that is. So life cycle assessment counts emissions that happen from all of these different processes upstream from us, so in manufacturing or supply chain, and downstream or in uh, waste management. And there are a couple different uh, modes of life cycle assessment. Um, and like you said, you can look at many different <coughs> alternatives, and they don't necessarily have to have the same physical form. Right? Life cycle assessment is based on the idea of service provision. So let's say the service I want is reading services. I could read a paper book, I could read an ebook, I could listen to an audio book in my car. In the future, I'll just you know plug something into my head and I'll get the reading services. Uh, although not the tactile pleasure, right? So the service is essentially equivalent. The physical form of these things is very, very different. The supply chain of this is pulp and paper, ink uh, based on petroleum. The supply chain for this is rare metals and glass making and aluminum production and electricity production. So really different physical thing, but we can compare them using this kind of tool and say, what are the trade-offs? How much energy is used versus how much water is used, for example. So that's uh, uh, essentially the uh, principle of LCA. There are a few steps um, that we go through. We set up whatever the scope of the study is, and the service or functional unit is kind of what we base our decisions on. And as an engineer, my piece of it um, is primarily to go in and create a model of how these things are manufactured. I, I look at that process level information and I collect data from manufacturing facilities or energy producers in order to get you know, the best data I can. Um, sometimes I can't travel all the way up the supply chain. I'm not going to go to Indonesia to you know, audit an iron mine. Um, so I use background information that other people have collected and I plug it into the models that I have built myself. Okay? Um, from each of these come emissions and I can add up all those emissions into what's called a life cycle inventory. So this is just like a bill of materials or a bill of emissions. And then the second kind of major piece is I look and see where do those emissions go. This is what's called the impact assessment side. So how do they move through the environment? How do they get chemically or physically transformed? And then how do we come into contact with them? You know, I breathe the air, right? there's some exposure to uh, aquatic life as well and that will cause human impacts or ecosystem impacts um, or sometimes just pure you know, changes in atmospheric concentrations of pollutants uh, that I can quantify. So all of this is quantifiable. Uh, and then I get some quantities and I have to decide what to do with that information. So that's LCA in a, in a nutshell. All right. What's fun, and Will Walker was in my class and he can attest to how fun it is, Right? Is that once you start doing this, you realize, wow, I'm just I'm modeling, you know, my computer, but my computer is connected to aluminum production. Aluminum production is connected to electricity. Electricity is connected to water use. Water use is connected to aluminum and steel and food. And, oh my gosh! And so it gets to be very complicated, which is why it's really useful to use those background models to help you deal with the complexity. It's essentially a network model of the economy, right? That links industrial processes together in physical and energy terms. So it's, it's, if you're familiar with kind of input-output models from economics, it's similar to that except we're counting physical flows instead of monetary flows. All right. And what can you do with it? You might remember that picture 
I showed of fracking wastewater um, from shale gas production. So if I just burn the gas, I get this quantity of greenhouse gas emissions, right, which seem good, seem better than oil or coal-based emissions. But if I count all of those upstream emissions from manufacturing the pipes and pumping the water and from, <clears throat> from all of these other steps, transmitting the gas, the some leakage in the process, I get a life cycle quantity that's uh, quite a bit higher, 40% right? higher than just combusting the gas. And naive policy is based on this quantity. And we want a comprehensive energy policy, environmental policy, to be based on this quantity because it's capturing the actual emissions that are taking place throughout the whole system. So that's just an example. Uh, usually we care about more than one type of impact, however. So this is just a laundry list of environmental issues that I might want to quantify. Toxicity to humans, acid rain, uh, eutrophic lakes, uh, land use change. And, uh, and I'm going to try to quantify all of these and then figure out well, what counts more. Greenhouse gas emissions more important than total water use. How do I balance that? Right. And I can extend those to either dollars of damage or health damages, depending on what, uh, what I care about. Okay, so um, that's just by way of background, and um, now I want to talk through a few examples um, that give a flavor for the work I do as it's related to public policy. So this is one of those examples where. Um, there's an existing policy. It is the 2007 Energy Independence and Security Act signed by President Bush Jr. And among other things, it set um, maximum wattage standards for uh, indoor bulbs. And uh, what this did was essentially push incandescent bulbs that couldn't meet this wattage standard uh, and uh, started this replacement uh, for uh, incandescence with compact fluorescent bulbs. Right now, we're kind of pushed past CFLs and we're through LEDs, but at the time, CFLs were really dominant. Walmart made a big splash in this year uh, by saying, we're going to sell 100 million bulbs this year. People said, you are crazy. And then they sold 150 million bulbs. So this was the this was event. So they did very well by this uh, policy. Uh, and, uh, and you can see where the different states were. Uh, the one environmental downside Right? We're saving energy, but there's a downside, which is each CFL uh, contains a small bit of mercury, maybe two to five milligrams, depending on the size of the bulb. And, uh, and as you probably know, mercury is not a good thing to have around. It's in the bulb while it's on, but sometimes bulbs break. And if you want to think about this from a holistic point of view, it would be good to consider where the bulb's coming from and where are they going when we throw them away. And so that's what I was concerned about at the time. I wanted to know what was going on with the mercury, and was there a trade-off in mercury? Um, just by way of background, fluorescent lamps aren't a large contributor to overall mercury emissions in the U.S. It's only about 1%. The largest contributors are utility boilers, mostly coal-fired power plants, and municipal solid waste combustors, of which we have many here in the New region. All right. Nevertheless, what happens when you follow this Mercury, I'm going to do a material flow analysis on mercury and try to figure out where it's going and how it's being affected by this policy. So I mine mercury, I send it into CFL lamp production, I then put the lamps into use, and they're saving energy. So I'm not using electricity, meaning I'm avoiding emissions of mercury from those coal-fired power plants, the largest source of mercury. Right? Then I send the bulbs after they break down somehow. Maybe they break in my house. They certainly break when I throw them in the trash. Right? And even when you recycle bulbs, what they do is put them in a, basically a, a trash can and crush them. Um, and sometimes they have vacuum assist, sometimes they don't. Um, so there's some mercury lost in transit and also in the recycling facility itself. Um, so we just counted up all that mercury. And we were trying to balance where mercury emissions are being avoided from use and where mercury emissions are being increased because I'm switching from incandescent bulbs that have zero mercury to CFLs that have a little bit. And a little bit times 100 million bulbs is a lot right, in mercury terms. So um, thinking about the avoided emissions here, uh, it, it's not a trivial question, actually. 
it depends on a lot of different things. The mercury that's avoided. It depends on the mix in the region or the state, as we did it in this case. And if I have pollution control in place, then it depends on which power plants are on at which times and which have solar <coughs> controls and, and so on. So it gets to be a little bit complex in the technological modeling. And it depends on where the coal is coming from. And this isn't static either. And sometimes, depending on the price, we'll import coal from Indonesia, or maybe we'll get it from Powder River Basin, Wyoming. It really depends. And so this is a bit of a moving time. Nevertheless, we looked at this particular year, and we took an average year. And this is what we found on a state-by-state -state level. So we did that analysis for each of the 50 states. And in these kind of stripey states over here, these were states in which implementing this policy led to an increase in, CF, in mercury emissions overall. The additional mercury emitted from the lamps was more than the avoided mercury um, from the energy savings. In these other states, however, New Mexico, North Dakota, West Virginia, it was very beneficial from a mercury point of view to have this policy, as well as from an energy point of view. Say, the coal producing states, right? Yeah. And you might intuit that uh, these are states with a high proportion of coal in their state grid mix, whereas Alaska has a lot of oil, California has a lot of natural gas, and these areas have a lot of hydrogen. So um, we took this information and we looked at some other policies that people were talking about at the time um, in relation to the, uh, that federal legislation, the Energy Independence and Security Act. Um, this was the legislation that actually came into force, which was banned incandescence. And we could say, if we do that, we're going to save 25 tons of mercury, mostly from avoided emissions from utility boilers. So that was uh, a good story. However, if we just put pollution control on all of the utility boilers and forgot about the CFLs, we wouldn't save any energy, but we would reduce more of our mercury load. Okay. Another thing that people were talking about at the time with this legislation that didn't make it into the final legislation was requiring a recycling rate for incandescence, which we found wouldn't do much in mercury terms, um, or putting in a renewable portfolio standard, essentially changing the grid mix of each state up to a certain minimum level, um, also would have a pretty small effect in mercury terms for this policy. So uh, this was, uh, I guess, the first study I did that really had a, a strong policy tie. Uh, it percolated through time, and, and we picked it up again recently um, to look at how those emissions, those changes in emissions, would actually affect people's health. And this is where it gets a little more complicated because the exposure to pollutants and their fate in transport depends on where the emissions take place. You saw that. But also when the emissions take place. Here's an example for ozone or smog formation. Um, in order to make ozone, you need NOx, right? You need volatile organic compounds, but you need sunlight. So if you emit these things, in the evening, it doesn't really have a big health effect. It's when you emit them in the morning and then the ozone is around all day that you get this kind of <coughs> smog effect that you see in LA. And then the other cities. Okay, so we had to break apart the time dimension of this. And so how we did this was to look at how power plants were dispatched over time. So which power plants were on at which time of day. Right? And this would tell us what emissions were happening at those specific times in those specific areas, regions of the country, um, in this case. Now, we wanted to consider these lighting changes, switching over from one type of light to another. But of course, different people use different numbers of lights, right? And at different times. I went to visit Charleston recently, and the days were long again. It was wonderful. Whereas now, you know, it's uh, dark out um, in the early evening. Um, so, when you use your lights and how many lights you have that depends on regions. Luckily, we count this kind of thing, thanks to the Department of Energy. So um, the, this particular survey, the Residential Energy Consumption Survey, you can use to figure out how many bulbs are in each household in each region, and when are they being used. And then you can go to another map, which you'll notice the geography doesn't line up very well, um, to say, well, 
how do power plants get dispatched, and what are their emissions at each time of day in each region. So a lot of what I do is sitting with you know, spreadsheets or you know, the, the MATLAB equivalent of spreadsheets and kind of pairing these things together, cleaning them up so that I can finally run the analysis, which usually takes a trivial amount of time once everything is clean, um, and then I can find out where are emissions happening and when, and how does that affect exposure in people's health. So luckily we got to use another model here um, for SO2 NOx and particulate matter damages. Um, CO2 damages, we used a $20 per ton. Um, there's not a direct impact on human health, but there's certainly going to be some indirect impacts. Um, so the, the current number that EPA is using is around $20 per ton. And then mercury damages um, of about $4.3 million a ton. But remember, there's only 100 and so tons emitted in total. Um, and so we can look at the health benefits of these energy policies. Right? In Boston, if I take one household and I switch out all of the current bulbs for CFLs, I will get approximately $42 of annual health benefits. And for other regions, you'll see much larger benefits, up to $180 per household per year. And I can contrast this with the actual savings I get in energy terms, because right? I'm saving energy with this uh, switch in bulbs, but it's very small compared to the health savings. So what I'd like to do with this, and why I'm excited to be affiliated with the policy school, is I want to find some policy instrument to say, society expects this. We should be able to incent energy savings and changes in technology to essentially pay forward in time these benefits, uh, which will be accrued um, to people's health as a society. That, yeah. that actually, like all along, I've been kind of trying to figure out what is the incidence of this policy? Like, who's actually paying? You know, in terms, so how much you know do these new types of bulbs cost relative to the other? Right, because somebody somewhere is kind of paying for the switching out, right? If you mandate it, like the price of the consumer or something, how do you? Is that relevant? Or <laughs> no, but it, I mean it is relevant. These, but we haven't been talking about costs of the bulbs at all. In reality, many times the cost of the bulbs has been covered by utility companies who are trying to meet their energy efficiency mandates, essentially, um, related to the renewable portfolio standards. So, uh, but even if you just look at the operation, forget about the cost of the bulbs themselves. This is just annual benefits right. in health and operational costs. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's one example related to um, existing policy. Um, and I, I don't have a clock on. Oh, How's it going? Oh, good. Okay. So, yeah. so um, I wanted to go through uh, a second uh, example related to some proposed policy that's of a different flavor, but you can see the mechanics are similar. So here's the policy. This is uh, from the EPA. Essentially, EPA would like to make more stringent standards for wastewater treatment and uh, fluent uh, uh, discharge. So this policy is related to eutrophication, which is when you have too much nitrogen and too much phosphorus in your wastewater, or in water that comes from field runoff. Um, and it lands in water bodies, and it causes algae growth. The algae die, and in doing so, they use all the oxygen in the water for decomposition. And then nothing else in the water has oxygen to breathe in. Everything else dies. So that's the major problem of eutrophication, and it's widespread all around the world. Um, there's a little bit less um, uh, synthetic fertilizer used in Africa. Um, that's why you see the lower number there. So this is a major, major driver of U.S. environmental policy related to the Clean Water Act. And the EPA is looking at making these standards more stringent. Right? So this is essentially where we are now, right, at level one. And we want to go down two orders of magnitude in terms of phosphorus, uh, which will require plants to upgrade their technology and spend more on pumps and energy and chemical treatment um, in order to achieve these limits. So again, the questions I naturally have when looking at this are, do these policies actually meet the goal of reducing eutrophication? And 
do I get any unintended consequences? Do I get some trade-offs? So similar to the previous example, we used an engineering model of wastewater treatment, and then we linked it to an economic model of energy flows and chemicals production uh, to see uh, uh, where emissions were taking place all throughout the supply chain. So uh, probably no wastewater treatment engineers here, but this is the kind of technology that several different designs. All of these would provide the same function, right? meeting those effluent limits, but you can use technologies in lots of different combinations in order to do so. So this is what we found um, from this example, and I'll just walk you through the graphs. Um, and again, forgive me, I, I love numbers and graphs, so I'm just going to be who I am. All right, so up here on the top, this is the effluent coming out of the wastewater treatment plant. This is what the policy is supposed to reduce. Okay? So nitrogen in yellow, phosphorus in green. And you can see as we move, the policy gets more stringent. We move to level three. The effluent limits go down. So that's good. From the effluent coming directly from the wastewater treatment plants, uh, we've achieved our goals. However, when we look on a life cycle basis, when we include all of those supply chain effects, Right. All the emissions of nitrogen and phosphorus related to upstream chemical production, energy production, you can see that the effect is not so clear. Right. The green here on this lower graph is the actual effluent that's being reduced. Okay, so that's reflected in the green. But then you can see other things that are increasing as we uh, make treatment more stringent. Chemical use increases, and especially this orange uh, square here in this particular type of technology I use, which is RO reverse osmosis, the additional nitrogen and phosphorus from upstream electricity production wipes out the benefit from going to this higher uh, effluent standard. And so we then took this information and went to the EPA and gave a series of webinars to EPA on their um, proposed technology, and they were very interested to see, well, you know, we can write the standard in a way that encourages utilities uh, to have more energy efficient or chemical efficient uh, treatment technologies, uh, which was encouraging. So do the policies actually achieve their goals? Not entirely from a life cycle uh, perspective, depending on the technology. And there's also trade-offs. Yes. Just a question on that last one. So a lot of wastewater treatment, that's where that would occur, right, at a wastewater treatment plant, yeah. had um, moved to renewable energy or actually using the heat from the wastewater to produce electricity. Is that one strategy for reducing that electricity load, or is that...? Yeah, the heat, not, because the heat in a wastewater treatment plant is either supplied on site through biogas production, as we do have in Deer Island, um, or it's produced from natural gas uh, combustion, usually. But the electricity load, you know, which is a lot for stirring the propellers that you know, essentially mix everything, um, that can be produced on site, like what you said, using renewable energy. And that would be a policy that we could model. Right? We could say, what if we change the grid mix or we have only on site electricity production with storage from solar panels? That would really change this. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, this previous slide was uh, on the actual emissions of nitrogen and phosphorus, but there are trade-offs too. Here I have global warming uh, emissions, CO2 equivalent emissions, which naturally increase the more energy I use, the more chemicals I use to achieve that effluent limit. And I have some other nasty chemicals and emissions that I don't want, right? Ozone uh, depleting chemicals, and I can look at acidifying emissions also. So. Again, EPA is charged not just with water uh, and wastewater standards, but with air quality standards. Uh, and that because they oversee uh, multimedia soil, water, and air quality for the entire country, they're very interested in these trade-offs. They don't want to solve this wastewater effluent issue and create some other problems in the meantime. Uh, so it fits in nicely with the mindset from this life cycle point of view. All right. And, uh, and finally, I, I want to go back to one of the states, uh, which is the state of Pennsylvania and a different realm. So we talked about air, talked about water, now I'm going to talk about solid waste. 
right? So I'm hitting on all the ball points here. Uh, and this is with a particular kind of solid waste called non-hazardous industrial waste. And maybe you've never heard of non-hazardous industrial waste, but it's the dominant waste type, solid waste type, in the country by, by a good order of magnitude. So EPA thinks maybe we have somewhere between 250 and 400 million tons annually of municipal solid waste, MSW. The irony is they don't actually know. Right? They don't count or measure. It's not actually their uh, remit uh, to measure the quantity of solid waste. Um, similarly, they don't know exactly how much national uh, uh, non-hazardous industrial waste we have. The last time we counted it was in the mid-1980s. So this is a black hole in terms of solid waste uh, management and policy. But these are the, the numbers that we think at this time. Um, so this is waste from mostly upstream industrial processes um, that, that, that cities and you as a consumer never see or, or appreciate. Plenty of these large uh, companies that deal with industrial waste do something beneficial with it. They build roads, they sell it to people who are next door to them who might have some other type of industrial concern. Uh, and so we wanted to look at this waste sharing among industrial producers, um, which is another area of industrial ecology called industrial symbiosis. Okay, so we looked at all of the different places this was happening in Pennsylvania. There's a big effort in the 90s to organize this kind of activity, and, uh, and most of those efforts failed. But really, it's a self-organized kind of system. And, and uh, this open uh, uh, industrial capitalism, if there is information and uh, price signals such that uh, one company can see that there's a value from using another company's waste, then they'll write up a contract and share it. We found hundreds and hundreds of examples of this happening in Pennsylvania. And the only reason we were able to document it was Pennsylvania had a registry of non-hazardous industrial waste reuse. No other state had this at the time, and the state was thinking about killing this registry requirement, uh, which was uh, uh, onerous to businesses, so the, so the line was. So we wanted to say, well, what, what are the energy benefits of all this industrial waste reuse? In this case, there's no policy. Nobody's telling these companies to share this waste, but there's still going to be an energy benefit and maybe it's important on a state level, and we wanted to see how it fits. Um, so uh, we did this in a couple steps, and, uh, and the details aren't that important. But there's different types of industrial waste. We looked at where it went. Right? We looked at what the waste was substituting for. So if I use you know, flue gas desulfurization um, gypsum, right, I don't have to mine gypsum. And there's a benefit for me avoiding that mining. So I can count what the benefit is. Right? And maybe the benefit is in energy terms or emissions terms. So <clears throat> I'm just going to look at this substitution of copper um, with uh, dust and scrap from a steel mill. Okay? And I link it with those background data I was talking about. And I can add them all up, right? times the total quantity, and get a total amount for that particular substitution. Um, and then I do this for all the different industrial waste types. So this is just a bunch of spreadsheet work. But, uh, but fun to finally get at the answer, which was on a state level, I'm saving 13 petajoules of primary energy. Now, petajoules is a great uh, energy uh, engineering <laughs> unit. What does that mean compared to all of Pennsylvania? Well, you know, it looks like about 1% of all the energy used by industry in Pennsylvania, I'm saving, and I'm not even doing it on purpose. Uh, I'm also uh, saving emissions of CO2, greenhouse gas, SO2, and NOx, which are precursors for ozone in the case of NOx, and both of them are precursors for acid rain. So if I took all of the solid waste, not hazardous, generated in Pennsylvania and did something good with it, right, I could get even higher. So this is what was happening. This is what could happen, maybe in, in the case of some kind of incentivizing policy. And we wanted to translate this and say to Pennsylvania, is this important for your state or not? What we found was the energy saved here through reuse and recycling, which the state was not even counting at all, was higher than either the hydroelectricity generated in the state or any of the other renewables generated in the state, which were getting a lot of incentives. Right? 
and, uh, and uh, loan guarantees to companies to come into Pennsylvania. Uh, so by expressing these benefits in energy terms, we could s express to the state uh, the benefits uh, of this kind of policy. But a lot of those benefits would, would be dealt outside the state. Yes, and that's, that's the tricky part about this. You know, EPA as a national body or a federal body can look add benefits to society overall. In reality, some of those emissions go into Canada, right? and actually a lot of our mercury floats over the Pacific Ocean from China. Uh, but, uh, but we can look at a national scale also, and maybe there's some kind of interstate mechanism we can use. Uh, the other question I had is, like, what is the, the right level right, of, you know, say, reusing or recycling this waste? Because there's a level that the market just determines on its own Right, and then we could mandate more, we could incentivize more, but how do we know kind of what are we getting relative to maybe these other um, these other ways of savings that in terms of what the cost is? I guess that's what I, I keep coming back to as an economist. It's like what sure. what are the alternatives, and how do I know which one I should incentivize based on like sort of the per ton cost of incentivizing that? Or something yeah, kind of right. So you you could incentivize. Non hazardous waste trees. So, a lot of this is just about information. Right, right. right so, what the, the UK has done is to essentially build a registry, a national registry, open to everybody. The Pennsylvania registry was only open to state employees of Pennsylvania, this particular office. Right? The NISP, which is the registry in the UK, is open to everybody, and it's used as a kind of Craigslist for industrial waste. Uh, so, it's low cost, but it enables this kind of Waste right. Like that's the thing that economists like, like more information. How, how could that be bad? Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, so I think that's uh, those are the examples I wanted to talk about. In general, f from my point of view, I, I like this tie to public policy because the systems modeling work I do is at that kind of scale. It affects everybody across time, across space, and it's nice to talk to policy makers who are also struggling with that kind of responsibility and to, to consider uh, long time spans and, and uh, uh, trade-offs among different people. Um, I'll say that there's other examples of work that I do and these are some other um, areas. I'm always looking for policy collaborators and especially you know, for examples like that one around um, the health benefits versus the direct energy benefits. I'm going to stop there. I don't know what to do with that. And so I'm always eager to talk with economists and people in public policy and policy analysis to figure out, well, are there instruments that can be uh, actually implemented based on this information? Um, so I'm always looking for collaborators. Uh, I teach a class on life cycle assessment that Will has taken. And if any of your students are interested, please have them come over. I've had sociologists and History majors come and take it, so it's not uh, a heavy engineering prerequisite. Um, and uh, we also, I, I'm not sure if this has been talked about uh, in, over here, but we have this new uh, MS degree in the College of Engineering on Engineering and Public Policy, uh, and we're really excited to uh, have more of this collaboration, mm -hmm. not just on research, but also with joint <laughs> classes and, and student uh, activities. So um, that's all. Thank you again for the. Uh, invitation to you. And, uh, and again, it's nice to, to talk with friends. So. Um, great, good talk. Um, the one thing I'm always struck by, and again, you know, we, we work together on some projects, and, 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 and it, you know, I just think you know, the LCA is such a you know, you know, holistic way of thinking, not just in, in, in just the application, but also just the mindset. And, you know, policymakers, especially elected policymakers, usually aren't accustomed to that. And, you know, and, and, and sort of the question about usable knowledge, I mean, one of the things that I think is always sort of a frustration, you know, is, is this sort of gap between expertise, you know, whatever, it could be economic, it could be a lot of expertise, although economics has the virtue of coming up with a number oftentimes. Yeah. You know, we whereas yeah, it's yeah. not wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It could be wrong, but it's a number. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's sort of an effort. You know, it's sort of like you know, the, the more complex the dynamic, the more you come off saying on one hand, on the other hand, and it sort of it depends. 
And you know, policymakers oftentimes are like, don't tell me it depends, tell me what the right answer is. And how do you deal with that, given, the, given the, the integrative holistic nature of LCA thinking, not just thinking, but also the kinds of results you get, as, well, if you value this, then this, if you value that, then that. How do you, you know, obviously, most time, you're probably not dealing with elected officials most of the time, you're usually dealing with you know, more expert in the staff, but how do you deal with that inevitable, well, what do you think we should do response. Well, I'll say in, in the examples that I've shown here, it's much, much easier for me to evaluate an existing policy or a proposed policy than it is mm -hmm. to package the information I get from an analysis to be policy relevant. Because I don't actually know what that is. Mm -hmm. right? I, I don't know what information is exactly useful, and a lot of different people might use it different ways. Sure. Right? But I can look at this let's say, Energy Independence and Security Act provisions and see essentially how it would work, how it would play out in the waste management system and in the energy system, and then come up with that number, that 26 mm -hmm. metric tons of, of uh, mercury emissions avoided. So uh, I see that happening more and more. There's more scenario development mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the use of kind of prospective approach uh, rather than trying to, to use all the numbers, so you, you come up with a dollar uh, uh, number in, in an economic analysis. The problem that engineers have is we love numbers too much, so we have a number for greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. and a number for water. It's all these different numbers. Um, and, uh, and of course, the, the impulse is to get ever more detail, to produce ever more metrics mm -hmm. that must be useful to somebody. Right. Um, but and being, that's the danger. But obviously, the sort of role then is then to be the honest broker in a sense of coming up with the best information possible so that others can decide how they want to use it. Yeah. Even if sometimes they use it wrong. Yeah. That's not your department. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I mean, again, that's why I, I would like yeah. more of our engineering students to understand what is actually usable now. Yeah, because it's, it's one of the great dilemmas. Yeah. 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 You've made a great case, Matt, for the need for engineering and public policy to be together, at least maybe for us in public policy to have engineers mm -hmm. read our work. So I, in my Emerald Cities book on the chapter on waste, I talked about NISP and the importance of it. And of course, I use the numbers of, you know, their numbers of how much was saved cost-wise from all of the people using the network and the amount of resources. And then you kind of say, well, yes, of course, this has CO2 implications as well. And then talked about policy replication. So there was this Chicago Waste to Energy or Waste to Profit Network where they were trying to replicate it. And what I focused on was the inefficiency of the policy learning process. And of course, so had you read this chapter, you might have provided a very different kind of input on you know, the, the, the cost savings. So it's not really a question, but a comment that just as each example you go, I think, oh my goodness, you know, someone doing a lifestyle assessment should be reading everything you write. And, and folks in the UK, I think, have maybe yeah, at least they have a good CO2 numbers. estimate. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you, Matt. It's great to get a full review of and, and some details on some of the specific projects you've worked on. One of the things, I, I'm curious about your sense, because one of the challenges, obviously, is like the silos of our governance processes, mm -hmm. right? No, like, no. the people who are thinking about energy and greenhouse gases aren't thinking about health, necessarily, or aren't thinking about waste. Um, you know, we, we tend to separate all these issues, and the whole point is, you know, that you, your work demonstrates so clearly is that they're all connected, and we, you know, that's our, our, some of our problem is we, how we've siloed everything. So I'm curious just your um, perspective on optimism for breaking down some of those silos, I guess, um, and the impact of life cycle assessment in, in kind of highlighting the value of, of breaking down. So that's, maybe that's a big, broad question. But then I also wanted to um, ask you about, because it, it there's also a, a um, 
some backlash, I feel like, sometimes with life cycle assessment to use to point out a specific against a certain kind of policy, right? Yeah, sure. um, that, that depends how you draw the boundary mm -hmm. on what you care about and your time frame and your spatial scale, right? Um, you, can, you can almost make all kinds of arguments for or against almost anything, <laughs> depending on what you prioritize. So, um, like, I guess I'm thinking about, um, you know, the hybrid cars with the batteries and how much energy, and, and it's not, you know, or, or even your light bulb assessment, it's, it's not, if you think about a broader time frame, it's not necessarily, is this light bulb better than that light bulb on any one metric? It's like, are we gradually transitioning away from fossil fuels or not, right? And, and the, so people resist specific policies based on, look, this technology actually is worse on some level, but then they lose the macro, right? Mm -hmm. That ultimately for society, you know, we do need to tra want to be transitioning away from fuels <coughs> on some macro level. I think that's hard. I mean, some people will not agree with that, but that's what my perspective. So anyway, I'm, I'm just curious what you what your take on kind of that interpretation of life cycle assessment for policy justification or resistance. Yeah. I participated in a debate once, which was, uh, it was me versus my, my graduate thesis advisor. <coughs> so the fact <that> was stacked. <laughs> and I represented the perspective of, you know, detailed LCA will give you actionable information, and the uh, implementation and practice of LCA has improved a lot in recent years. He's, his perspective that he argued was, um, LC is too complicated and different people are using it in different ways so we just need to come up with some simplistic metrics and you know, get the direction correct. Mm -hmm. right. And we could have argued the other one. So anyways, that's a, a, a long-standing debate going on. Um, and uh, I would stand by my original perspective in that debate which was that the practice of LCA is like the practice of science. And someone comes up with a study, someone comes up with a competing study, who's right? Well, you need to replicate all those studies and get a bunch of people together. We saw this a lot in the corn ethanol debate mm -hmm. in terms of, is it actually beneficial for emissions reduction or are we actually shooting ourselves in the foot? Mm -hmm. okay. and, uh, and eventually I think consensus was reached in that particular debate, um, but it took dozens of studies to do that. Um, so uh, I agree, you know, there's lots of conflict and and different sides use their uh, uh, you know, find studies they want to support their arguments. Um, but uh, but if you are a good scientist, then you can find out eventually what what the truth gets uncovered. Um, and, and and I'll say I am pretty optimistic. EPA has re you know, gone through big reorganizations recently and put a lot more effort into cross office work with these task forces. I know the LCA folks at the EPA pretty well, and they're connected to all the different offices and do uh, interesting multimedia work. Um, so I, I see that as a good sign. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, excellent talk, thanks. Uh, I was also curious about uh, questions of data collection and data quality in lifecycle inventories. Uh, just anecdotally uh, worked on uh, with the WARM model on the waste reduction model and then we worked on electronic waste but when we started drilling into these individual uh, data points turned out that you know there are some of them are really based on very general assumptions sure. and it was not so uh, maybe, maybe you know what 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 are your adventures in the space of data collection and, and how do you deal with kind of the different problems of uh, data quality? Well, yeah, it's, you're very right to point out, and that's the basis of much of the skepticism around LCA, mm -hmm. it's the junk in equals junk out argument, and it's, it's very difficult to generate primary life cycle inventory data because you need to be on site at a facility and somehow measure you know, emissions that are occurring from, a, you know, let's say, steel smelter. It's not like there's an umbrella that's collecting all the emissions. This is very difficult, just from a metrology point of view, um, but also from an access point of view. I mean, a lot of this is under confidential business information also. So um, the trend has been 
in the past to get a couple pieces of data and then make wild extrapolations to other processes or other elements in the case of uh, electronic waste. Um, but uh, another encouraging sign is that LCA and in general environmental disclosure is becoming much more mainstream in, in, in industry and, uh, and there's a race to publish their own data sets. Mm -hmm. um, so the quality of self-reporting uh, has gotten much better uh, um, even um, since the time I've been doing this. Uh, so I think that's a good sign. There's also been a lot of methods development and how you deal with uncertainty and all the stochastic and mm -hmm. uh, Monte Carlo simulation-based model. Um, so we're getting better on the, on the engineering model side. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so the WARM model, you probably know, is developed by ICF International. Right? The so is it Franklin? Or? Uh, yeah, so Franklin had the contract and uh -huh. they lost it to ICF. Okay. So if you really have a, a beef with it, I can... <laughs> so I'm actually going to thank Matt, and if you guys have questions, you can come up and ask him, just because some of us have to run off and teach class, <laughs> and I have to steal back my pointer from him. So, but thank you very much. This was